Hey, welcome back, everyone. The, one of the interesting things about the birth of Jesus is that the people who should have been the most interested, the most ready, the most excited, didn't appear to be interested at all. In fact, when the wise men, quote unquote, came from the east, searching for him, they went to the leadership. They actually went to Herod's palace and they inquired. They said, you know, we've come. To worship him who was born king of the Jews? Where is he? And Herod had no idea what they were talking about at all. And he summoned his scribes and experts and they dug around and said, Oh yeah, he's, he's probably in Bethlehem. That's what the Bible says. But they don't appear interested. Even after the wise men go and they give their gifts and they return home, there's no indication that the people who should have been the most interested even cared. And I know, sad, but I know there are a lot of people in this world who don't give God a second thought and you really don't care. But you're not one of those people because you're here. And the fact that you're here, no matter how confused and doubting and whatever you may be, you're interested because you're here. And I want to tell you that I'm here connecting with you for one simple reason. I believe that if you knew the truth about God, on a deeper level, that if you understood him for who he really is versus who maybe your church told you or what your parents told you or what the culture told you or whatever, that you would love him more, that you would not be on the fringes or on the edges wondering and stepping in and stepping back, but you just jump in because he's awesome. <clears throat> in our last video, we jumped into some big stuff. And after conversation with a couple people since then, I realized that maybe I jumped in too deep too fast. And so I'm actually working on another video. It's going to take a bit to get it ready. But I'm going to make a video that connects why we think the way we think with how we got there. Because if we can understand what made us who we are and how we see things and where our doubts and fears and opinions all come from, and then walk that back to the source... And then question it all and build back on a firmer, more truthful, more accurate foundation. We'll get to a better place. And so <clears throat> one person asked me after the last video, like, if a person's searching for God, what difference does it make of the com commandments or commandments or promises? Like, what difference does that make? And on the surface, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But underneath, it makes a huge difference because it's not about whether or not their commandments or promises. It's about what that fact says about the author of those commandments or promises. You see, if, if God is somebody who sent a list of things to accomplish and then stood back and said, well, if they can make it, they can make it. If they can't, they can't. It's not a very compelling picture of God. But if instead God came to a bunch of freed slaves who were for the most part probably illiterate and knew very little about him and came and said, listen, I'm here with you right now. If you look back, you'll see all the things that I've done with you that brought us to this place. Now here's what I'm going to do for you. If that's the kind of God he is, that's a very different picture. And then you jump into the future and you see Jesus coming, born as one of us, living as one of us, being misunderstood, lonely, mistreated, rejected even by his own family. And you understand that God did that because he was trying to show us, not only do I love you, not only have I made incredible promises to you, but I'm going to send my son to accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished on your behalf. All you have to do is decide, do you love him or not? Do you want to follow him or not? Do you like the kingdom that he stands for or not? When we look at the Bible in truth that way, that what is true and what isn't true shapes and forms everything we think and build out from there, then truth is huge. 
for example, you've probably known people that you had an opinion of, and then something happens that's really negative that they do, and your opinion of them drops. Because more information in changes how you perceive them. Or you knew somebody else and maybe your opinion of them was so-so or not that great. And then you find out that they did something really awesome and selfless. And your opinion of them grows. Truth matters. So what kind of God is God? Is he a demanding God? Is he a commanding God? Is he a loving God? Is he a vengeful God? If you went to church, you were given a picture of God. Was it accurate? You'll only ever know if you have the courage to go back, peel away all the layers, and take another look. It's the only way you're ever going to know. Because let's face it, there's thousands and thousands of different churches, all with a variation of a, of a version of who God is, even within my own church. One denomination. There are a variety of views of who God is, of what he wants, of what he expects, of what he's offering, of what the good news is or isn't. But what's the truth? And you're here, and I believe you're here because you want to know. Otherwise, you have all kinds of other things you could be doing with your time. <clears throat> the book of Revelation. A lot of people are interested. In fact, when I was in Halifax years ago, um, there was I became friends with, a, with the Wesleyan pastor. And he told me his members wanted him to do a series on Revelation, but he didn't understand Revelation that well himself and wasn't sure what to do with it. Wanting to understand Revelation without taking the time to understand all of the Bible that comes before it, it's kind of like wanting to master calculus, but you haven't taken the time to do adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. It's not going to work. You're never going to get there. And yet, the story that Revelation is telling is the same story that Genesis told and all the way through. Different imagery, yep. More details, yep. But same story. So for example, in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is described, by the way, the book of Revelation is not a book of prophecy. It's a book of the revelation of Jesus himself. Are, is there prophecy in it? Sure, there's prophecy all through the Bible. But if you hone in up on the prophecy and trying to figure out who's doing what and what's going on where and miss Jesus, you've missed the story. Anyways, in the book of Revelation chapter 1, a couple of times it refers to Jesus as the one who is and who was and who is to come. The one who is and who was and who is to come. That's a weird way to say it. Like, why wouldn't you just say the one who was and is and is to come? I mean, that's that's in order. He, history, present, future. Past, now, later on. But no, every time that the book of Revelation describes Jesus in reference to time. It says he is the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Now, I want us to come back to Genesis chapter 20, when God spoke from the top of Mount Sinai. And look at what he began with. I am, present tense, the Lord your God who brought you out, past tense, from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, slavery. Past tense. You shall, future tense, have no other gods before me. You know, we can take that as, you must have no other gods before you, as a command. But it's not written that way. We've imposed that onto the text because that's how we see it. In fact, if you go back into chapter 19, which leads into chapter 20, obviously, Moses has a meeting with God, and then he talks to the people. And the people basically just say, listen, Moses, you whatever God wants us to do, that's what we'll do. Just tell us what to do, and we'll do it. 
So their mindset before God ever said a word from the mountain was you need to give us your instructions so we can follow them and get from you what we want from you. Which makes sense from a human point of view. Everything that we experience in this world is an exchange. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. I'll pay you this money, you give me an education. You give me a job, I'll work for you, you pay me. Everything is an exchange. Some people even treat their personal relationships as a give and a take. But that's never how God framed it. It's not what he intended. But he knew that's what they would do. He's God. And the truth is we all start from there. We all start from approaching God from a transactional point of view. He has something we want, heaven. And we have something he wants, our devotion. But he's not like that. In fact, on the mountain, he didn't just give the, the two tables of stone, what we call the Ten Commandments. He gave instructions on building a sanctuary, which we'll get into in a future video, because truth matters. When he gave the instructions, he didn't center on the building itself. He centered on a piece of furniture that was going to go in the building. Imagine, imagine you're going to planning to build a house. And the first instructions you give your builder is how to build the dining room table. What you want for a dining room table. Like most builders will look at you and go, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm just going to build you a house. You want to put a table in, that's your business. But God's first instructions to Moses relative to this building was one piece of furniture. And the reason why he wanted this particular piece of furniture made and the way he wanted it made was because the two tablets of stone that he gave Moses were to go inside of it. And he called those two tablets of stone his testimony. And he repeatedly called them his testimony through the rest of the book of Exodus. By my count, and I could be off, up or down by a couple, 28 times in the book of Exodus, where the whole story of God's writing on the two tablets of stone and the building and the piece of furniture to put them in, all of that, where all of that happens, 28 times, it's his testimony. Which when you back up and look at how it all happened, it makes perfect sense. It was God who initiated bringing them out of Egypt. It was God who had told Abraham 400 years before that his descendants would even go to Egypt, that they would be enslaved, that they would be for a certain period of years, and then he would bring them out. God said all that. He knew all that way in advance. And when he came, he didn't come and say, listen, you get yourselves out of Egypt, and then I'll take you to the promised land. No. He came and he delivered them. Every plague, it was him. Every step, every step on the way to, out of Egypt, he did it. So when he came to the mountain and he said, listen, I am God. I brought you out. That part they could not argue with. Sure, there are probably some who could delude themselves into thinking, well, listen, you didn't do the walking. We did the walking. Sure. They walked behind a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They walked through a sea that God opened. We have a part. We can decide to follow God or not. But we only have that choice because God made that choice. We only have the option to come back to him because he made it possible to come back to him. And this whole mess started with Adam and Eve not really understanding what kind of God he was, and the serpent more than happy to lie about him. And everything that's happened since has been God's attempt to reveal himself to us without forcing us back to himself against our will. So back to the building that God made, or told Moses to build. When Moses brought the instructions back to the people, 
they were told to bring materials that they could use to build the building. But they were only to bring what they wanted to bring. God didn't specify a percentage of what they owned. He didn't specify an amount of things. He didn't say who should bring what. He said, this is what we need. You bring what you want. Because that's what God wants, a relationship. He wants willing people to say, God, I recognize who you are. I recognize what you've done for me. I recognize how much you love me. And because of how much you love me, I love you. That's what he wants. It's all he wants. And if we don't want that, we still get to live this life and do whatever we want with it without his interference. We literally have nothing to lose and the most amazing God to gain. Nothing. Think about it. If you're an atheist, you believe that you lived, you were born by some kind of scientific long process series of random chance, and here you are, and you're going to have your... 60 or 70 or 80 years or whatever you get. And then you die and it's over. Well, God is saying, no, you didn't get here by accident. I saw you before you were born. I, I know all about you. And I'm giving you this life to live. You can choose to do with it whatever you want. You can love me, ignore me, hate me, curse me. You can do whatever you want with this life. And when it's over, if you didn't want me, it's over. If you do want me, we'll spend eternity together. I mentioned a couple videos back about hell and being eternal and all that. Someday we'll get to that. But I do want to say this. If you're honest with the Bible, the Bible says that eternal life is a gift given to those who believe in Jesus. One of the lies that Satan tells, in fact, it's the very first one he told overtly in Genesis, is you will not die. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not forever dying. Death. So we literally have God, heaven, and eternity to gain and we have absolutely nothing to lose. The question is, what kind of God is he? And as we go deeper into the scriptures, and we start unpacking stories that you might be familiar with, but you've never seen the way we're going to look at them, you're going to see that God's been trying to tell us from the very beginning, I love you, and I will do whatever it takes to save you but I'm not going to save you against your will. The choice will always be yours. We'll see you next time. God bless.